Can I help you? I need help recycling something, and no one in town is willing to help me. Uh, you need something picked up at your house? Or? No, it's my husband. I need to recycle my husband. Say hi, dear. Hello, dear. <laughs> Please. Yeah, we don't do that. Why not? He's original. Everything's original. All good. Working condition. He's got his heart, his appendix, his liver. Liver? You want to hear a joke about a liver? One time there was a liver who wanted to be in a band and he wanted to play the organ. He's got two kidneys. Look, ma'am, I, I get it, but we're a plastics recycling place. We're not really set up for people. Okay, well, can you make an exception? No. All right, this is what is wrong with the world today. Okay, no one is willing to just make a tiny little exception, bend the rules even like a tiny bit just to help a woman out, help a guy out, anyone out, just help someone do something good. It's all bullshit. What? Plastic recycling is basically bullshit, okay? We just put it on a barge, we send it overseas. Only like 5% of it gets recycled. The rest gets incinerated. Do you want your husband to be incinerated? Look, if it doesn't have a resin identification code on it, the little triangle symbol with the number in the middle, it doesn't come in here. And even then, it only has to be a one or a two. Okay. Like this? You guys want to hear about a number two? No. no. Okay, all right, fine. All right, you're gonna do so great, big boy. Bye, sweetie. Don't tell anybody <laughs> I did this. No, of course not. I'm gonna leave a great Yelp review. Looks like we got to the bottom of that. The word scam gets thrown around a lot these days. Basically, if somebody's making money from a thing, someone's gonna call it a scam. We tend to be a bit flippant with that word. But look, if you're providing a good or a service for people and you make a profit from it, that's not a scam, that's just participating in an economy. There's nothing wrong with that. It's only when you profit off of willfully deceiving people or misrepresenting the facts, that's when it becomes a scam. And as much as it pains me to say it, it's true. Plastic recycling is a scam. In fact, it's the worst kind of scam because it's not only you know somebody profiting off of it, it's damaging the planet, it's poisoning our bodies, and worst of all, we kind of have to participate in it because not participating in it is even worse. It didn't start off this way. In fact, plastic was specifically created to be more environmentally friendly. I know that sounds weird to say, but keep in mind that like everything that we make with plastic today, we used to make from natural materials. And a lot of those materials were animals. Like in my video about airships, um, I talked about how the ballonets or the air sacs in the British R101 airship, they were made out of something called oxycum. Cecum is basically a gross word for stomach lining. But for the R101, it took 50,000 oxycum to make those air sacs. 50,000 oxen had to die to make one airship. And I mean, don't even get me started on whale oil. We almost extincted an entire species for lamps. And then there was the ivory trade. Now, elephant poaching for ivory is still a problem, unfortunately, but that ivory today is usually more used for luxury things and decorations and whatnot. But back then, basically anything that you wanted to be white, they used ivory for that. From door handles to pens to piano keys. Yeah, the phrase tickling the ivories used to be a very literal term. And in the 1860s, one place you might find people tickling the ivories was in bars and pool halls where people played pool with ivory billiard balls. I, I, I don't have a billiard bar. Just pretend I'm holding a ball. Billiards was a hugely popular game in those days, which led to a shortage in the ivory supply, which is another way of saying the world was running out of elephants. Enter a guy named Michael Phelan. Michael Phelan was the world's first billiard superstar. He migrated to the U.S. from Ireland in 1823 as a young boy, and his father ran some pool rooms in New York City. So yeah, from there, he just became obsessed with this game. And he went on to become like the biggest expert in the world. He actually published the first book on the subject called Billiards Without a Master in 1850. He published a few more books over the years, but along the way, he helped to kind of standardize the game and the design of the pool table, including the diamonds and the cushion. He later formed a company called Phelan and Colander, where they manufactured pool tables and, of course, billiard balls. He was almost single-handedly the reason that pool became such a popular game in the 1860s and indirectly why the elephants were disappearing. So in 1869, Phelan and Colander created a contest. They offered up $10,000, roughly 136000 in today's money, to anyone who could create a substitute material for billiard balls. Now, did he do this out of the kindness of his heart or for an intrinsic love for animals? No, he did it because the price of ivory had gotten so high that it threatened their profits, so they had to find another solution. That concept will come up again in this video. 
Many investors and chemists entered the contest, but nothing quite had the right weight and strength that it was needed to replace ivory. That was until John Wesley Hyatt entered the picture. Hyatt created a billiard ball out of a material that he called celluloid, which was made of cellulose nitrate. Today, cellulose nitrate goes by the name nitrocellulose, and it's made by mixing nitric acid and sulfuric acid with cellulose, which is what makes up the cell walls of plants. He basically found a way to turn plant material into a hard moldable plastic. And by the way, he borrowed heavily from the work of a UK chemist named Alexander Parks, who invented a similar material in 1865. He called it Parkesine, but he wasn't able to find a commercial application for it. Now, the only problem with Hyatt's balls is that nitrocellulose has a little habit of, you know, exploding and catching fire. If you thought nitrocellulose sounded a little bit like nitroglycerin, yeah, there's a reason for that. Yeah, nitrocellulose is extremely flammable, but you know, luckily nobody smoked in pool halls back then. But it was cheap, the materials to produce it were abundant, and no baby elephants had to lose their moms. So Hyatt started a business making celluloid pool balls, and the rest is history. Plastics took another big step forward in 1907 with the introduction of Bakelite. It was invented by chemist Leo Bakelin, so yeah, it's actually pronounced Bakelite, not just Bakelite. Learned that today. Now what was cool about Bakelite was that it was fully synthetic. There was nothing natural involved at all. It was used to make knobs, dials, radio cabinets, as well as auto parts and costume jewelry. The next big leap happened in 1932 when Imperial Chemical Industries out of Britain created the first petroleum-based plastic called Perspex. It's basically acrylic glass. Other companies like DuPont got on the plastic train and invented nylon and Teflon, and plastics as we know it were officially part of the manufacturing landscape. They were like the wonder material of the 1930s. Nobody had ever seen anything like this before. It felt modern. It felt like the future. But like a lot of technologies, it took a war to make them really explode. Production of plastics skyrocketed during World War II to support the war effort. Nylon was used to make parachutes, perspex, which is also known as plexiglass, was used as periscope covers, and there were thousands of other uses. In 1939, 213 million pounds of plastic was manufactured in the U.S. By 1945, the production hit 818 million pounds. Plastics manufacturers were making record profits during the war, but that war did, thankfully, end. So they needed a new way to keep that gravy train rolling. So DuPont and others pivoted into designing household goods, from flooring to fake flowers to dishware to furniture, even clothes. It was cheaper, lighter, available in all kinds of colors, and it could be made into form factors people had never even seen before. There was seemingly nothing that you couldn't do with plastic, and people went nuts over it. This was a major part of the post-war boom. High-tech plastic items flooded every American household. This miracle material from just a decade before was now everywhere, ushering in a whole new age of abundance. And this energy carried right on into the 60s. Just one word. Yes, sir. Are you listening? Yes, are you. Plastics. As the 60s drew to a close, plastics had been a part of the world for roughly 100 years. It helped save the elephants, win World War II, and transform the homes and lifestyles of people all around the planet. It was only in the 70s when we began to realize all this plastic bacchanalia had a major, major downside. In March 1972, a paper was published in the journal Science by Edward J. Carpenter and K.L. Smith Jr. warning about plastic washing up on beaches and microplastics being found floating around the Sargasso Sea. The paper warned that without some kind of mitigation or recycling effort, plastic waste would continue to accumulate in the environment because unlike paper and, and glass and wood products that break down in a few years, plastics take anywhere from 20 to 500 years to break down, depending on the type of plastic. And even when they do break down, they leave behind chemicals that could be harmful to ecosystems and human health. The report recommended either strict regulation on the use of plastics and the types of plastics produced, or an expensive campaign to properly recycle and dispose of plastic waste. And in response to this report and the public outcry it created, the plastics and petroleum industry stepped up and took a dramatic measure to fix the problem. And some people don't. People start pollution. People can stop it. That's right, kids. They took the bold step of blaming the consumer. The infamous Crying Indian commercial was produced by the Keep America Beautiful campaign, whose origins actually go back to the 1940s, because littering's been a problem for a long time, and obviously there's nothing wrong with wanting to cut down on litter. Litter sucks. But they do have a history of taking funding from the very companies that produce the disposable litter in the first place, so they've been accused of greenwashing, because they kind of shift the responsibility to the consumers instead of holding these companies accountable. Keep America Beautiful is still around today, and uh, their legacy is mixed at best. And yes, the Indian in that commercial is an actor named Iron Eyes Cody. He'd been playing Indian roles in Hollywood movies for decades. He actually took his name uh, from a role that he played in the Bob Hope movie called The Pale Face in 1948. 
His real name, though, was Espera Oscar de Corti. And if you think that's a strange name for a Native American, that's because he was actually Sicilian. He wasn't even a little bit Native American. He just pretended to be his whole career. Nothing gross about that. By the way, Keep America Beautiful has been catching heat about this commercial for a long time now, but to be fair to them, nobody really knew his actual ancestry until after he died, so they had no idea at the time. Although even if he was an actual Indian, the whole thing, the whole concept does kind of, you know, smack of appropriation and exploitation. Um, but that might just be applying modern standards to it. It was actually a really effective commercial at the time. The Ad Council says that it cut down on litter 88% in 39 states. So uh, make of that what you will. It also has to be said he advocated for Indian causes his whole life, and he actually married a woman named Bertha Parker Palin, who was a prominent Abenaki Seneca archaeologist and activist. But I mean, still, the fact that he became known as the face of the native Indian when he was actually an Italian in cosplay the whole time is super cringe, and I'm just going to step away from this rabbit hole now, because all that aside, the biggest problem with the Crying Indian commercial is that it implies that people can fix pollution by throwing away their trash the right way. When the fact is, even if that schlub in the car at the end of the commercial, and every schlub in the whole world for that matter, put their trash in a can, there would still be too much trash, much of it plastic, for the world to handle. The rallying cry from the environmental community for decades has been Reduce, Reuse, Recycle. An acronym that was immortalized in a banger Bollywood movie last year. Recycle your trash! In 1970, just before that damaging report on plastic waste came out, the first Earth Day was celebrated. It was proposed at a UNESCO conference with the aim being to promote peace and environmental awareness. As part of that event, the Container Corporation of America sponsored a contest to create a symbol to promote recycling. The Container Corporation was a large producer of recycled paper products back then. The winning entry went to a design and architecture student named Gary Anderson. It features a Mobius loop depicting a cycle of uh, arrows that, you know what it looks like, you've seen it. You've seen it because it's everywhere. It's universal. In fact, it's known as the universal recycling symbol. Just one look at it and you know this is about recycling. And you've probably seen lots of different versions of it over the years. And the reason for that is because it's not trademarked. Nobody owns it. It's in the public domain. Anybody can use it. Which gave the plastic manufacturers an idea. At the same time that they were running a successful anti-littering campaign in the 1970s, the plastic manufacturers and petroleum industry were paradoxically pushing single-use plastics. Like I talked earlier about the plastic household items being a revolutionary thing in the post-war years, and that's all well and good. They made a lot of money off of that, but I mean, like, I've had this colander for like a decade now. Probably paid five bucks for it. It's not going to buy a lot of executives' yachts. It's the recurring purchases, the things you have to keep buying over and over again. That's where the money is. That's how the razor blade companies get you. That's how the Keurig cups get you. That's why all the apps and software are on a subscription model these days. It was the expendable plastic items, the plastic cups, the plastic drink bottles, the plastic bags. This was their cash cow. And they knew this going all the way back to the 50s. At the National Conference of the Society of the Plastics Industry, or SPI, in 1956, participants were told that, quote, development should be aimed at low cost, big volume, practicality, and expendability, and that producers should aim for the majority of their products to end up, quote, in the garbage wagon. The problem was that people still valued plastic items and reused them over and over. Like the idea of using something just once and throwing it away, especially something as permanent as plastic, it just, it just felt gross to people back then. Keep in mind, well into the 80s, most sodas were sold in glass bottles and aluminum cans. Like, I'm actually old enough to remember when I was a kid going to the store with my mom, we would carry in the glass bottles that we'd use that week and returning them for a nickel each. And then my mom would let me use that nickel in the gumball machine. Then we'd load up on gingham, reshoe the horses, and ride the coach out to Cheyenne drinking a sarsaparilla. I am old. Like, back in the 50s, people used to keep and reuse their plastic dry cleaning bags. But a major scandal erupted when it came out that over 80 children suffocated while playing with the plastic bags. Regulatory agencies began pushing for plastic bag bans, which, of course, would have cut into the industry's profits. So, in the spirit of never letting a good tragedy go to waste, they pushed people to do what they already wanted them to do in the first place. Throw the bags away. They promoted the disposability of plastics in a public relations campaign that involved pamphlets that said, quote, Never keep a plastic bag after it's served its intended usefulness. Destroy it, tear it up, or tie it in a knot and throw it away. To do otherwise, quote, is the worst mistake a mother could make. Slowly but surely, people got used to this idea of throwing away plastic items. And more and more one-time use plastics were made. Most of it wound up in landfills or were incinerated in what's called WTE, or waste to energy process. Neither of which the general public was particularly thrilled about as cities became, you know, 
overrun by garbage in the 70s. And the idea of burning plastic and putting all those chemicals into the atmosphere was, it was all becoming a very heated issue. So in the 80s, as more calls for bans on single-use plastics were floated about, they pivoted toward promoting the recyclability of plastics. In 1985, the SPI, the Society for the Plastics Industry, created the PRF, the Plastics Recycling Foundation. They began lobbying states and municipalities to invest in mechanical plastic recycling operations, at the taxpayer's expense, of course. The problem is, they knew, over two decades of trying and failing, that there's no real solution for mechanical plastic recycling. What I mean by mechanical recycling is, of course, the, the separating out of plastics by resin type so that they can be chopped up, melted together, and then reused. Which, obviously, sounds great, but it's not as easy as it sounds. First of all, all that separating out of the different resins has to be done manually. Now, yeah, over time it's become a lot more automated, just like everything, but it's still a laborious task, made even more laborious by the fact that there are literally thousands of different types of resins. Now, granted, these fall into different categories of resins that combine better than others, but even if you have the same resin types together, there are often different plasticizers and stabilizers and coatings that all reduce the effectiveness of recycling. And even that's only when you can actually get the same types of resins together, because often packaging uses different types of resins and molded together in a way that can't be separated. And because of all these impurities, recycled plastics age faster, they're less stable, and are basically just an inferior product of virgin resins. Oh, and by the way, it also costs way more to make this kinds of plastic. So look, if you're a packaging company, are you going to spend more money for an inferior product? It's, it's just not a viable solution. And the plastics industry was well aware of this problem. Back in 1986, a spinoff group from SBI called the Vinyl Institute, they issued a report on the recycling problem and concluded that the most valuable use for discarded plastic was incineration for energy production, saying, quote, Unlike the other components of the waste stream whose useful lives are best extended by recycling, many plastics contribute the most to resource conservation when they're burned for their energy content. And it ended by saying, quote, Recycling cannot be considered a permanent solid waste solution as it merely prolongs the time until an item is disposed of. So they knew there was no real path forward with mechanical recycling. But the alternative was producing less plastic and making less money. So, hmm. If there was only one way to make it look like there was. Which brings us back to their clever idea. In 1988, the SBI introduced the Voluntary Plastic Container Coating System, which broke down the thousands of different plastic resins into basically a handful of resin types, and then encouraged producers to stamp that type onto their products. Because, you see, this would help the recycling centers to separate out the various types of plastic so they could more easily recycle these obviously recyclable plastic items. Now, if only there was a symbol they could use that automatically said recyclable, you know? Preferably something that's not trademarked, something in the public domain, something that everybody would, you guys know where I'm going with this. Ladies and gentlemen, the Resin Identification Code. Now, chances are you've seen one of these stamped on your Starbucks lid hundreds of times, and, and maybe you knew what it stood for. There's a lot of smart people in my audience, but the average person just saw a recycling symbol with a number stamped on it. What do these numbers mean? Well, they stand for different types of resin, big acronyms for even bigger words. And it's really for the recyclers and not the consumers. Like the only ones that you really need to worry about as a consumer are these two, number one and number two. And the reason for that is because, um, well, they're the only ones that are recyclable. Like, at all. Yes, five of the seven of these recycling symbols are completely not recyclable. Now the good news is a lot of the single-use plastics that we deal with are in these first two categories. So a lot of it actually can be recycled very expensively into an inferior product that there's no real market for. Uh, by the way, I just want to clarify what I just said there. I said that they are not recyclable. Uh, numbers three through seven. Um, after looking into it a little bit closer, I realized that that's not technically true. They are technically recyclable, as in the technology exists to recycle them, but logistically and economically, for all the reasons that I talk about in this video, they usually aren't. So yeah, can they be recycled? Yes, technically. Are they recycled though? No. But it worked. The RIC codes, combined with a massive PR campaign throughout the 90s and lobbying by various industry front groups, convinced the general public that if you throw your plastic waste into a recycling bin, it'll get melted down and made into another Starbucks lid. The great plastic circle of life. But today, 30 years later, still only 5% of plastic is recycled into other plastic products. 
The other 95% is thrown into a landfill and incinerated. <laughs> By the way, if you want to know just how shameless these guys are about this stuff, some of them have been trying to make the argument that incinerating plastic is recycling it into energy. A 1986 paper from the Vinyl Institute said, quote, the practice of incinerating or burning solid waste to recover energy is really another form of recycling, with heat or light being the final product rather than reprocessed material. In fact, SPI tried to make this argument to the Oregon Attorney General in 1994 to get around their required recycling targets. Uh, it didn't work. So where does that leave us? After over 50 years of willfully misleading the public about the viability of plastic recycling and succeeding, we're drowning in more plastic waste than ever. And the problem's still getting worse. Most of our plastic is burned in incinerators, or even worse, open pits, releasing harmful chemicals into the atmosphere like greenhouse gases, and even worse, cancer-causing agents like dioxins and furons, which, even if we don't breathe those in firsthand, they still get into our food supply, like our eggs and our fish. And much of the plastic that isn't burned is carried by ocean currents to one of the Earth's five garbage patches. Um, the best one is obviously the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, but the North Atlantic, South Atlantic, Indian Ocean, and Southern Pacific all have country-sized gyres of plastic trash that wreak havoc on ocean ecosystems. Plastic waste is so ubiquitous that it's literally on the summit of Mount Everest, and it's been found in the Marianas Trench. And if you're really ready to be horrified, one study estimates that humans ingest up to 5 grams, or the equivalent of one credit card worth of plastic, every week. And it's truly a problem that's only getting worse. Studies have estimated the amount of plastic waste in the U.S. is expected to go from 73 million metric tons in 2019 to more than 140 million metric tons by 2060. It's become such an obvious problem that, yeah, once again, people are starting to call for regulation on single-use plastics. And once again, the plastic industry has responded with obvious greenwashing. And this might be the worst one yet. We're talking about advanced recycling. Advanced recycling. Advanced recycling. Here are five things you need to know about advanced recycling. Yeah, they call it advanced recycling or chemical recycling. And the idea here is instead of just melting down the plastic and making some more plastic out of it, they break the polymers down completely into their basic chemical elements. They do this through processes like pyrolysis, gasification, hydrolysis, methanolysis, and more. Then once those basic chemicals have been extracted, they can be remade into everything from fuels to feedstock or, you know, back into plastics. The best part is it's not just limited to a couple of different resins. A lot more types of plastics can be recycled with this method. And of course, this sounds like a great idea. It sounds like the, the natural progression of technology. Like, of course, in the 2020s, we finally have the ability to do this. But there's actually nothing new about it. They've known about this since the 70s. And they knew in the 70s that this wasn't a solution to the plastic waste problem. In fact, a research paper on chemical recycling from 1978 said, quote, It is yet to be demonstrated that the energy obtained by combustion of fuel oils obtained by pyrolysis is greater than the energy put into the pyrolysis furnace. What is indisputable, however, is that the energy obtainable from the fuel is very much less than the energy used to manufacture the polymer in the first place. In other words, you get a lot less energy out of it than you put into it. Energy and money, for that matter. So, yeah, it's, it's still not economically feasible, just like mechanical recycling. A report by the consulting firm Arthur D. Little, Inc. in 1973 pointed out another similarity to mechanical recycling in that the process requires very pure plastic stock in order to produce a usable oil byproduct. So again, you still have to separate all the different resins out, which makes it cost prohibitive. Now, you might be tempted to say, hey, that was 50 years ago. Technology's come a long way since then. But they've been working on that this whole time. And even as technology's progressed, it's, it's just still never made sense. In 2003, a longtime industry consultant named Alan Griff laid into the idea of plastic to plastic chemical recycling, calling it, quote, another example of how non science got into the minds of the industry and environmental activists alike. His report described chemical recycling as inherently, quote, thermodynamically enviro negative. And here's the part that cracks me up. He also said, quote, didn't anyone know this already? It's disgraceful either way. Either people knew it was an energy loser and didn't want to let it be known, or else they didn't bother to figure it out at all. That is a lot of shade for a boring industry report. But the thing is, they did know that it wasn't viable. In fact, in 1994, the vice president of Chevron Chemical, Erwin Leibowitz, he was meeting with the American Plastics Council and told them that chemical recycling is, quote, a fundamentally uneconomical process. It has all the same problems as mechanical recycling, but they kept pushing it as a solution, not because they genuinely wanted it to work, but as a smokescreen, just like they always have. In 2020, a group called the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives looked into these chemical recycling efforts, and they found that there have been 37 chemical recycling facilities proposed or built since the early 2000s. Of those 37, only three were operational, and none were successfully producing new plastic.
Not one. An even more recent report last year from the groups Beyond Plastics and IPEN found that only 11 chemical recycling facilities have been built in the U.S., and only four of those are operational. But even if they were all fully operational, their combined capacity would only handle 1.3% of the plastic waste produced in the U.S. each year. There's a part of me that wants to show a little grace here. And some of you may be thinking the same thing, you know, that these things take time, that you got to start somewhere, and that we should support these efforts. Fair enough. And the industry has set some very bold targets in the coming years. ExxonMobil, Dow, and Chevron Phillips Chemical have each announced that they plan to process at least a billion pounds of plastic waste through chemical recycling, with ExxonMobil saying they'll do it by 2026. Dow has promised, quote, a series of planned facilities that would process 1 billion pounds a year by 2030. Shell claims to be building a paralysis oil upgrader facility with the ambition to process over 2 billion pounds by 2025. That's next year. And look, I want this to be true. Of course I want this to be true. I want to believe that there's this banger new technology that's going to solve this problem and that they're serious about solving it. That's why these PR campaigns work so well. We, we want this to be true. But as I've shown in this video, they have a history of making bold claims in public while admitting in private that it won't work. And it's just really hard to believe that this is anything more than the same smokescreen they've been running since the 1950s. One person who agrees with my skepticism is a guy named Lewis Freeman. Lewis Freeman was the vice president at the Society of the Plastics Industry from 1978 to 2001. So you could call him the ultimate plastics industry insider. And in a recent interview, he talked about how the industry has always seen this as a public perception problem and not a technical or economic one, saying, quote, in 30 some odd years, there have been some slight improvements in the amount of plastics recycling, but for all the effort and money they spent, they haven't moved the needle hardly at all. If they use the same measure of success and failure that they do in running the rest of their business, they'd be out of business. So a lot of this video came from a report that came out literally just a few weeks ago from the Center for Climate Integrity. They did an excellent job. There's a lot more that came from. I'll put the link down below. Definitely go check it out if you have a minute. All this is, well, it's a lot. But what's the actual solution here? Well, the phrase is reduce, reuse, recycle. And those words are not in random order. We have to do the one thing the plastic industry doesn't want to do, and that's reduce the amount of single-use plastic. Look, plastic isn't going to completely go away. It makes our lives immeasurably better, and in a lot of ways, it is still a wonder material. I mean, imagine what it was like going to the doctor before plastics. I don't, I don't think anybody wants that. But especially now that we buy most of our stuff online, we just, we have to get a handle on the plastics in our packaging. It's just, it's gotten ridiculous. Like, does everything need to be wrapped in multiple layers of plastic? Actually, hang on a second. Let me, let me show you something. Else. I just got this boom pole recently. Um, actually, we use it for the first time on the sketch at the beginning of this video. But when I got it, and it was in, you know, the shipping box. Why am I standing? Hang on. <laughs> it was in the shipping box. I opened that up, and there was plastic padding on the inside that protected the actual box, which was, for some reason, inside a plastic bag. I opened up that box to find more plastic padding and another plastic bag covering this carrying case, which is made of some kind of plastic, which I opened up to find the boom pole wrapped in yet another plastic bag. Guys, it's a boom pole. It's not made of milk, it's not King Tutankhamun, it doesn't need to be hermetically sealed. It's a friggin' boom pole. Like, seriously, start paying attention when you open packages that you bought online at just how much unnecessary plastic is used in these things. It's ridiculous. And remember, each one of these has a 95% chance of getting burned and releasing chemicals into the air and into our food supply. There is no such thing as disposable plastic. It doesn't just go away. Speaking of those chemicals that I was talking about that are getting into our food and whatnot, I talked earlier about the different resin types. I didn't really go into detail on it because this video is already getting really long. So I made a second video that's all about those resin codes and I've uploaded it to Nebula. In it, I go through the seven different resin codes, what they stand for, what types of plastics fit into those categories, what those plastics are used for, and most importantly, what kind of chemicals come out of those things when they're burned. This is something I do fairly often. It's called a Nebula Plus video when I have some extra content or info that maybe doesn't quite fit into the main video, but it, it's still interesting to know on its own. So if you're a subscriber to Nebula, you get to see that extra content. I also have a couple of exclusive series on there, one on the mysteries of the human body and one on forgotten atrocities, which I'm still adding to. There should be another one on there uh, next month, actually. And by the way, that's just what I'm doing. There are over 150 other amazing, thoughtful creators on Nebula doing the exact same thing, like Legal Eagle, Isaac Arthur, Window Productions, Real Engineering. You can see all their content there early and ad-free and see exclusive content you can't see anywhere else. 
Many of them are also doing exclusive series just like I am. So like Real Life Lore has his Modern Conflict series, which is amazing. And Wendover Productions has the Logistics Of series where he looks into the logistics of all kinds of different things. Did I mention there's a lot of great stuff there? Nebula is a place buying for creators like me where we can actually focus on the topics and stories that we care about without being beholden to some faceless algorithm. It's been growing like crazy and there's some really big projects on the horizon. So if you haven't checked it out, Now's the time. Sign up at my link below and you'll get 40% off the annual plan, which comes out to like $250 a month. It's one of the best streaming deals out there. Or if you want a really great deal, Nebula actually has a lifetime membership for $300. You pay it once, you get Nebula for free as long as you're breathing air. And then you'll have a reason to, you know, take care of yourself and live longer. And don't we all need that? Either way, it's a great service and a great deal. Head on over there and watch my video on the chemicals and the resin codes as if you're not freaked out about this enough already. By the way, if you are not familiar with my channel, this is the first time you've ever seen my face, um, dude, thanks for watching. I really do appreciate it. I make videos on things that I find interesting. I like to think that I uh, apply a layer of interestingness to everyone's daily life. So if that's something you're into and you're interested, maybe check out some of my other videos. And if you like them, you get a, a chuckle here and there, I invite you to subscribe. Thanks so much for watching. A big shout out to the Patreon supporters and channel members that help keep the lights on around here. Can't thank you guys enough. Now go out there, have an eye-opening week, stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care. You seagulls want to be my friend? My barge life ain't too bad.